it's important that you become rather skeptical of your first intuitions because they're often very misleading. Um, just as every boy thinks his father is the strongest man in the world, and then when he grows up into adulthood, he realizes his father was not even close to being the strongest man in the world. It's not because of anything other than inexperience. Uh, to a boy, his father seems overwhelmingly strong. He literally can't even imagine anyone else being stronger than that. So naively, he thinks his father is the strongest man in the world. So too, in our relationship with animals, when we look at a silverback gorilla, it just looks overwhelmingly strong to us, to a degree which is almost absurd. Like, um, you picture the greatest combat athletes that humanity has ever produced, the prime Mike Tyson, Gordon Ryan for grappling. They would literally be torn limb from limb by an angry gorilla. It wouldn't even be remotely competitive. And so there's a sense in which we look at them in awe because of what they could do to us. But that can be very misleading. And just as a boy looks at his father as like the pinnacle of strength, you can't necessarily, from a position of inexperience and weakness, look at a given animal and say, oh, that must be the toughest animal in the animal kingdom. There's levels to this game. And um, uh, I think we can point out that the gorilla ultimately would be pretty low on those levels despite I got, the fierce I got, appearance. I have some pushback to this analysis <laughs> because the data, we don't have much data on this. Mm. We don't have- We actually have slightly more than you think, I believe. Oh boy. Well, it's anecdotal. I feel like it's out of context. So these species don't use, this is not MMA. They don't do interspecies fighting often. Yeah, but there are some ways of looking at this which can take this already interesting question and make it a lot more interesting. Um, first, we've seen that intuitions aren't to be trusted. So if intuitions aren't to be trusted, well, what is to be trusted here? Well, I've always believed that there are three general elements that determine what level of success or failure anyone will experience in combat. And this is true both for individuals and for groups and even all the way up to nations. Um, the first is what are your skills? The second is what are your physical and mental attributes? So it's skills, attributes. Those are the two primary ones. And there is a third, which is your experience in using those skills and attributes in real world scenarios. Okay, so whenever two We'll start with two humans. When two humans get into a fight, ask yourself, what is their skill set? What are their physical and mental attributes? And what is their experience in using those in real world applications? And that will give you your first look at, uh, okay, who's going to be the more successful? Um, then in addition to those three general elements, there's also four more specific elements. What is the ability of the combatants to initiate combat? Because initiation is a big deal in fighting. The one who sees the enemy first and can create ambush conditions or uh, uh, initiate combat, uh, combat in an area or a terrain which is favorable to them, this is huge in determining the, uh, the outcome of battles. Second, not only is initiation important, but disengagement is important. A lot of battles don't go according to plan. And so your ability to disengage at will and break off and away from a battle is key to success. So initiation and disengagement are big. The third big element, what is your ability to end a fight? Okay, do you have an efficient method of ending conflict? Without that, the conflict could go on to a point where you no longer have the ability to to, uh, uh, to continue it. If you have some succinct method of finishing, this is huge in combat in determining winner or loser. So both from a winning and a losing position? Yes, yeah, so if you don't have one, there's a high, much higher chance you'll lose. But if you have a, an ability to finish an opponent in the conflict uh, reliably, this is very, very uh, important in determining success or failure. And third is your ability to endure a conflict longer than the person you're, you're engaged in, okay, so engaged with, sorry. 
And so you get these four more specific elements now. Do you have the ability to initiate contact at will? Do you have the ability to break contact and disengage at will? Do you have the ability to finish your opponent efficiently? And do you have the ability to endure longer than your opponent does? If you have all four of those, that's huge for co- uh, for combat. That probably applies to human on human. Everything. Military conflict. Board, everything. Even all the way up to nations. Yeah. Um, also ask yourself, what are the most efficient methods of combat across the globe, across all species, all times, et cetera, et cetera. And you'll see that ultimately they always come down to three things. The first is concentration of force. Okay, One of the most successful combat strategies of all time is the ability to take concentrated force against a zone of weakness in your opponent. And if you can do this, you will often break through to a point of vulnerability, attack that vulnerability in a way where your opponent cannot respond and cannot recover from that vulnerable point being broken. Do a high amount of damage with precision. Yes. So this is one of the great uh, combat strategies in, across the animal kingdom, across human history, etc. The second would be ambush tactics. If you can ambush an opponent with the element of surprise, this is huge for success in combat. Almost all of the the truly successful predators on this planet are ambush predators. Um, The ability to get off to a good start in a way where opponents simply can't recover is huge for combat. Are we allowing ambush in our discussion? Because humans would call this cheating perhaps yes we would and <laughs> although, although humans are pretty damn good at it too so <laughs> um uh and then the third is endurance okay some uh uh species some people uh humans actually are pretty good at this um use endurance as a weapon and they simply wear an opponent down over time and uh break them and internationally this can be done economically um, through, through through numbers, et cetera, et cetera, and, uh, and you can destroy someone with just sheer endurance. Yeah, a lot of wars throughout human history has been siege warfare. Yeah, and so when you ask yourself, okay, which one of these animals are going to uh, be the most successful in combat, ask yourself, well, there's these three elements which tend to determine success or failure in warfare. Um, which animals exhibit these three principles the best? And we'll discuss this. But as far as um, uh, generalities go, uh, whenever you ask a question, who will win between A and B, ask yourself in terms of the light of what we've just discussed. What is their skill set? What are their attributes, both mental and physical? Uh, What is their experience in utilizing these in real-world situations? And then the four uh, more tactical elements. Who gets to initiate contact? Can you break off contact at any given time? Uh, What is your endurance? Can you keep going uh, longer than your uh, opponent does? So with skill set, I wonder if a big component of that of how much practice there is off off the battlefield. 